in part two of this week's discussion of marriage and family, we're going to look at some issues about diversity within the family units and within the institution of the family, as well as current trends in marriage and family. Um, there are, as the, the as we talked about early in the first part of this of this week's discussions, the notion of what defines a family, what a typical family looks like, is changing very dramatically, and. In fact, in, in uh, the discussions that you'll hear, uh, particularly in political circles, but also in religious circles and in ph sometimes philosophical circles, is, is, the, is the family dead? Is, is marriage as an institution uh, becoming irrelevant? Is, uh, is uh, the, this concept of the, of the traditional family, this is uh, generally thought to be a mother and a father and 2.2 children, I think, is the way the... the um, um, statisticians think of a traditional family. Um, is this over? Is this dead? Has is because of all the different kinds of um, variations that have been introduced into the concept of of marriage and family in the last forty or fifty years. Uh, much of this traces back to um, the feminist movement of the 60s but can go further back into that uh, during World War II when women the women in homes uh, the families uh, were forced to work in fact in many cases because uh, of the men being overseas at war um, and and uh, w there was a growing awareness during this period of time that some of those traditional gender roles particularly as it applied to women were very confining and unnecessary as women found that they could support their their family their household and and run the household without uh, without a, a father being there but the tradition of the two-parent family I believe was probably um, memorialized and as as television became very popular in America and uh, the family sitcoms were um, established on television things like Father Knows Best and Leave It to Beaver those things that you can still catch on television uh, show a mother and a father uh, not necessarily struggling but having to deal with issues uh, that arise with their children oftentimes little kids sometimes teenagers and generally speaking the kids hurl some kind of problem at the family and or they're dealing with some family and the the mother kind of calms everybody down and the, the dad would come home and kind of logically work sort things out provide the proper discipline and the children would be responsive and that was it for that week all of this in 30 minutes you know we really got the idea that a family this is how a family should function and then um, after World War II in particular when families had been split up and you know you think about it in terms of of uh, historically speaking I mean the whole threat of Nazi, uh, the Nazi movement and what it was doing in Europe cast a pall all over the globe and there was a uh, real concern about uh, our future and uh, of, of the human race even for that matter and and so uh, there are those individuals who believe that this retreat to a two-parent household and suburbia with nice houses with white picket fences and, and green lawns and predictable lives and fathers going off to work and mothers staying home and cooking and baking for their children that all of this would lead to healthy children and a happy life and uh, um, then the 60s come along and all of that kind of gets exploded with the hippie movement and the feminist movement and the anti-war movement and all of these uh, challenging authority and so new forms and new ideas about family living have developed and the question that uh, many individuals will pose now in this topic is is the is the family unit being torn asunder or is it being strengthened by these variations in families uh, that we're seeing in the last 20 or 30 years so when we look at issues about diversity, of course, there are those things like single parent families now where uh, they have increased quite a bit, and especially those that are headed by women, despite Vice President Quayle's concerns about Murphy Brown and, and her children in the early 1990s president, or her child rather, born out of wedlock in the early 1990s uh, presidential campaign. Uh, this is a continued to be a trend where um, sometimes women choose to to have children uh, very deliberately uh, as a single mom and to raise them that way uh, sometimes these 
uh, decisions aren't made deliberately. Sometimes, um, you know, relationships end involuntarily, so to speak, and, and mothers or sometimes fathers are left to raise children alone. But uh, the number of single parent families has certainly increased a great deal in the last 50 or 60 years. Likewise, families without children, these are, these are uh, well, the term that uh, I think sociologists use is, are, is child free because the term uh, childless uh, implies somehow that you're missing something and uh, um, there are many individuals who are choosing not to have children. Married couples make these decisions uh, because it gives them uh, uh, freedom from responsibility, allows them to pursue their careers perhaps and and to satisfy their own desires in their, in their lives in the years ahead and so many people are, are choosing this option quite opposed to the tradition um, of what used to be expected of married couples. When you look at uh, United States families from the concept of the many different ethnic groups you find a lot of diversity in, the, in uh, what uh, how families run and what families believe. Um, and it's interesting that uh, we find that with African American families, for instance, that socioeconomics uh, has a lot to play, and and really that focus on achievement and responsibility that is uh, in most middle class Caucasian families also exists in middle class African American families as well. Uh, but as a group, African American families are less likely to be headed by married couples and more likely to be headed by women. And there are a number of different reasons for this that uh, also are tied deep into our, our nation's history that uh, explain some of this. But this is a, this is a sociological, statistical um, fact, I guess you would say. Latino families, um, you know, the the uh, picture we have about Latin American men is that they're very, they're very caught up in the, the machismo, the macho kind of thing, and that uh, this is a factor that is decreasing with every generation among Latin families. Um, and, and, of course, it's very important to keep in mind that families coming from Spain um, or from Ecuador uh, or from... Um, Brazil or Mexico are very different from one another, and uh, and yet we tend to lump them all into this one with this one category. One of the um, things that uh, the increase in in uh, immigration from uh, Latin American countries has brought to the United States is um, some changing demographics in terms of um, of religion, for instance, and you find the uh, the Roman Catholic Church is growing in America largely because of the introduction of, of uh, more Latino families, which is um, the religion that's most closely associated with that culture. Um, Asian families, in some respects, retain those Confucian values that are very, very much connected to the East. Um, uh, Two-parent families are very common. There tends to be uh, much more of a, a respect for the elder generation in, in traditional Asian families. And um, you also find um, that, that Asians as a, as a uh, minority group are seen to be uh, more successful than other minorities in the United States. But this has to do with um, a lot of the uh, creative things that uh, Asians are able to do in terms, or not able to do, but they tend to do in terms of uh, um, economics that oftentimes working two or three jobs, and when I say creative, I don't mean um, that this is a necessarily positive, but often working two or three jobs in order to be able to uh, have the kind of lifestyle that they would like to have here. Um, in fact, uh, that minority works under a lot of uh, this, much the same kinds of disabilities that any other uh, ethnic minority does in the United States when it comes to economics. Native American families um, also uh, place a lot of emphasis upon the elder in, in traditional families, at least, and the elders play a very strong role in the child's development. But from tribe to tribe, uh, there are very different, uh, very different cultures and traditions in, in Native American families and, as well. Here um, is a graph of, of, well, of how families tend to be characterized among the different ethnic groups that we've been talking about here um, by families that are present with both parents uh, headed by mothers, fathers, or neither parent. We also have a look at families in terms of uh, well, this kind of gets back to the families of origin, so that many families are not biologically 
all the members are not biological descendants of both parents. And so you have what we call blended families. These are families that whose members were once part of other families who uh, begin to live together, whether through marriage or through some other type of arrangement. And certainly the number of blended families has risen as divorce rates have increased in the United States and as the alternatives to traditional marriage have developed. Um, that, and blended families have brought um, um, their own set of of uh, unique kinds of problems that have had to be sorted through in the last 20 or 30 years and are still being I think still being um, resolved and so this is a, a relatively new concept in America the whole role of step parents and and how how step parents figure in step parents have always been around but they're a lot more frequent than they used to be gay and lesbian families uh, with or without children have increased in recent years and as uh, as the slide suggests more and more states are now beginning to legalize marriage and this is uh, this is a type of family that I think we will see more of in the years ahead at least according to current trends now as uh, politicians are beginning to get on board with the notion that uh, gay and lesbian couples should have much the same rights in terms of marriage and adoption um, as any other couple. Some of the trends in, in the United States families at the present time include postponing marriages and childbirth until later in, in age. And you see here that the um, age of first time grooms is 29 years of age now and first time brides is 27. That, that is an increase of five years for each group over the last uh, 60 or 70 years. That's really pretty remarkable really. That's a, a, quite a change. Um, and likewise the average age of first time mothers is now about 29. There are some different reasons for this, but let me just say first of all that in the uh, when I've talked to raising the the European exchange students for so many years that I've done, um, you know, one of the things that's very quick to notice is that most of the most couples in Europe marry later, much later than American couples do. They may be together and and living together for a period of time, uh, but but they don't formalize that relationship until until they've really gotten through their twenties and. And uh, many of them have postponed having children until that time, even if they did get married earlier. Um, and and uh, early marriage and early ch childbirth was uh, was sort of a characteristic in America for quite a long period of time. Birth control has enabled us to uh, change that some, and that's probably one of the reasons why some of this is changing, particularly in terms of the average age of first-time mothers. The other thing that's happened with again with uh, redefinition of gender roles and and uh, that kind of thing is is that um, the idea of living together is now something that's much more uh, socially acceptable than it might have been 50 or 60 years ago. And uh, one of the reasons that the average age of marriage is increased is because it is now more acceptable for young people to live together and to share a household, have a sexual, uh, established sexual relationship that's recognized by everyone around them, um, have children if they so choose, and yet not uh, actually formalize the relationship through marriage and it's, it's just much more acceptable now uh, and much more frequent than it was 50 or 60 years ago and so it may not be necessarily that we're postponing uh, those commitments uh, to another person so much as we are postponing legalizing those commitments just an interesting kind of factor there and cohabitation is the term for living together and two-thirds of the married couples have lived together before they got married that's that's quite a bit different than it was um, some years back. Now the interesting thing about this is the studies of cohabitating couples and marital success are not necessarily positive. That is, um, you know, you would think that couples who live together and then get married are going to have a more successful marriage, but the statistics um, overall don't suggest that, that in fact uh, couples who um, live together have a, tend to have a higher divorce rate. Now there there is a distinction um, in, among those couples that that might explain this a little bit. This has to do with uh, uh, what their intent was when they moved in together. And so those couples who moved in together without necessarily deciding they were going to get married, um, uh, sort of saying this is a testing of of this relationship before we get married. Some couples move in together with that idea. Some couples just move in together because they want to be together. Uh, and it, and uh, there's a distinction in those groups and those I believe it is that those individuals who see this as a test for their relationship are the ones who are more likely to be successful. Um, 
those that are moving in together to move in together are the ones who, if they marry later, uh, do not tend to stay in those relationships. So, uh, or as frequently at least. And so anyway, there is a counterintuitive kind of thing here. Living together doesn't necessarily mean you're more likely to have a, a successful marriage when you do marry. In fact, um, there's some suggestion that those individuals who live together have less of an appreciation for the institution of marriage. And so having gotten married later may not have as much trouble letting go of that marriage as individuals who believe in the institution of marriage. And so therefore, you know, get married before they live together. Of course, there are, uh, it's an increase in trends of unmarried mothers, um, and, and this, this um, uh, has risen along with, this includes mothers in cohabitating relationships, so I mean this has risen along with, with uh, cohabitation and, and, you know, the trend also to uh, have children out of wedlock has increased. So here's an increase of, or rather a, a graph uh, reflecting when Americans marry and uh, the changing age at first marriage. So with all those other factors, um, uh, you know, this shows the fact that we are getting older or we're, we're postponing marriage until a later stage. I suspect that's a positive I, from a sociological st and a human standpoint, but uh, others may have different opinions about that. Here's a, some, a bar graph about Americans age 20 to 24 who have never married. And this was an age when, um, again, 50 or 60, 70 years ago, a high number of, of Americans were marrying during this period. If they weren't married by this period, they were getting married during this period. And so you can see here that, that um, Americans who have never married have increased quite a bit, quite a bit. Grandparents as parents. More grandparents are filling the role of the parental role uh, as more parents are working. We saw an earlier graph about how uh, with single parent families in particular, grandparents were often the alternate child caregiver while parents worked, while moms worked. Um, also, um, sometimes with uh, the uh, young adults moving back into the home, they're bringing children back into the home, and so grandparents are functioning as a parent in that role as well. And of course, in, in situations where parents, uh, young parents in particular, fail as parents and uh, children come into, um, well, into the child protection system or are in danger of that, sometimes grandparents will step in and will raise those kids uh, for their adult children. Another concept that you hear of frequently is the sandwich generation, and this thing, this really essentially involves middle-aged individuals who are raising children, who have uh, more elderly parents who have uh, problems and needs that require them to be supported, uh, either emotionally, financially, or even you know physically. I mean, by by their their grown children, and so this sandwich generation finds themselves uh, tending to the financial and emotional and physical needs of their children as well as their parents and so they're sandwiched in between those two generations of dependent individuals and uh, it is uh, in fact interesting that it is usually the adult daughter who is more frequently the caregiver for older parents than, than um, uh, other children and, and it's, it is also true that in many many families one um, one adult child seems to be the person that this responsibility falls to. Sometimes it's a single individual, sometimes not. Now divorce has, uh, the divorce rate has leveled off in the last uh, 20 or 30 years, um, but uh, but still is, is a factor uh, and it isn't true that if you get married, if they say the divorce rate is 50%, it isn't true that when you marry, the odds are 50-50 that the marriage will last. The 50% divorce rate uh, includes individuals who marry and remarry, or divorce, remarry, divorce, remarry, divorce. Um, that that is serial, they, they refer to it as serial monogamy, the idea that, yeah, I'm committed to one person for now, but, you know, 10 years from now, it might be another person. So the divorce rate is inflated by those individuals who, who um, you know, go through a whole series of marriages. And so you're, the odds of success in your marriage are greater than 50% when you get married. So just understand that and watch out about statistics because sometimes they can be confusing. 
Um, the, the divorce has increased because of a number of different things, not the least of which is the norms in our society have changed, and so the stigma that used to be associated with being divorced just isn't there anymore. And governmental policies have changed to uh, make it easier for individuals who have divorced. There are a lot of concerns about the effects of divorce on um, children, and um, depending upon which study you look at, those those effects vary quite a bit. Their early studies used to suggest, used to kind of spell real um, trauma and trouble for uh, children of divorce. Other studies have suggested, um, well, that it, it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, I think uh, it has a lot to do with how successful the parents who have divorced can relate to each other and can allow their own children to continue to have two parents even after that divorce has been finalized. Serial fatherhood where essentially you know you see fathers kind of trading in um, one family, their own family for another family is another feature that I, I, I'm not sure I, I suppose it, it certainly happens. There's no question about that. I, I'm not so sure that's a trend in, in, in our families at this time, though. Here's a bar graph that gives you uh, some statistics about the percentage of Americans who are divorced or broken out by um, racial or ethnic groups. Here's a geographical depiction of where divorces occur the most frequently. Um, and and uh, it's interesting that you see that um, Alaska, where this lecture originates and where m most of the students in this class live, is actually um, in the group that says a higher than average divorce rate. Now, wh why would that be? You know, it's an interesting question. I One of them may be, I think, that a lot of people come up here looking to change their lives and to be happy and find out that happiness is within. It's not in Alaska. But in any event, um, you can see there that geographically speaking that there, there are areas where divorce is higher and lower. Uh, um, well, I'll leave it at that. What reduces the risk of divorce? What are the factors that reduce uh, a person's chance of divorce? And you see here that uh, uh, education, college versus the high school dropout. You know, there's a shows the difference in divorce rates from that. So education uh, is seems to be a factor that uh, reduces the chance of divorce. Uh, being associated with religion, um, having grown up in a home where your parents stayed together in their own marriage. Um, being older when you have married, having a baby later after a marriage, and you know this is uh, having a um, uh, having a child at, uh, seven months or longer after marriage versus before marriage. So this really kind of implies, you know, what they used to call having to get married. You know, this idea of uh, were you pregnant when you decided to get married or not. You know, so obviously. There, there may seem to be more freedom of choice uh, if there wasn't a pregnancy associated with the marriage and, and also having a higher annual income. And this certainly relates to the fact that there's a lot of stress in lower income families uh, in and of itself would be enough to make that not surprising. So this is a, this is a graph that talks about the first 10 years of marriage and uh, do, certainly doesn't mean that 30 years down the road that it's the same thing. But some factors that might help you understand that. There are a couple of particular problems in, in family life that, uh, well, I'm familiar with in my work and uh, that those of you that are going into human services or dealing with individuals um, uh, in crisis or in the classroom setting should be aware of. And, of course, child abuse and spousal abuse are, are, um, are two of those, uh, those issues. You know, the majority of victims uh, uh, in child abuse are under the age of six, and neglect is the most common form of child abuse. And, um, something to the tune of uh, 40 to 45 percent of the cases that we entertain or that we rather we don't entertain but that we we uh, see in the office of children's services in our Kenai office which is a small community uh, about 40 to 45 percent of them involve some aspect of neglect in the, in the referral and this is fairly consistent nationally as well um, 
sexual abuse, physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse. It's uh, interesting to me that this slide doesn't have sexual abuse in it uh, for whatever reason, because it's certainly um, uh, 12 to 15 percent of our referrals involve sexual abuse. Uh, that is, a, you know, where an older person, um, you know, exploits the sexuality of a younger child in one way or another. Physical abuse is present in about 25 percent of, of uh, our referrals in Kenai. And, and, uh, Emotional abuse or mental injury is alleged in a probably about 20% of our referrals. When you talk about spousal abuse, um, you know, there's a, a lot of debate about how women can beat up men and, and women are arrested for domestic violence as well. But the fact is, is that more men than women are perpetrators of spousal abuse and uh, women are harmed much more significantly uh, physically speaking in domestic violence situations than any man is by women. So now it doesn't say that s there aren't some men who have been beaten by their wives, but the issue of spousal abuse and domestic violence is primarily uh, a woman's issue uh, and, and a, a, a much, much more complicated issue for women than it is for men. Um, Women staying in abusive relationships um, are, are fairly commonplace, and, and uh, they say that on average, uh, uh, I think a woman has to leave uh, six or seven times before she's able to finally stay away. And, and there are a number of different reasons for this, that some of which are listed here, you know. But largely, the patriarchy, the economic subjugation of women, and and uh, and uh, the fact that uh, you know men have. Uh, uh, tendency to be more aggressive and more violent and um, so are given more license to to uh, react violently to, to uh, separation. Police response to abuse has changed in recent years and this has to do with changes in laws that, that uh, in some respects require uh, police to make arrests instead of just kind of treating this as a man's home in his castle is his castle and he can do what he wants there. You know, beginning to see this more now as a as a, an actual assault and treating it as such. I just finished up a a class last semester called "Understanding Violence in Families." That uh, really, literally, we spent a whole semester talking about the uh, issues related to this particular slide. So, if this is something that would be of interest to you or helpful to you in your career, uh, and for any of you really that are working with people in your in I mean uh, as the focus of your career I would say that it would um, keep an eye open for it it was um, last semester it came it was offered under social work 290 um, it from I would imagine that'll be offered again in another year or two if not before Most people who get divorced will remarry within three years, and this is one of the things again that uh, I was telling you has a tendency to contribute to the the higher divorce rate. Um, and 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 the key thing here to kind of cut down on that is is that there are studies that show that if if a person hasn't identified his or her his or her role in the divorce, that is, how that person contributed to the dissolution of that relationship, if you don't want to look at it as a failure that whatever mistakes were made in that first relationship are more likely to be repeated in the new marriage. And so um, each each person in a marriage, even if it is, you know, one person tend, tending to be blamed for the, for the divorce itself, each person in that relationship needs to examine their role in what happened in that marriage uh, in order to head it off uh, before it happens again in the next relationship. If there are children from the first marriage brought into a second marriage, into a remarriage, then divorce is more likely. Um, discipline being the big problem for step parents, and and I, I, this is probably not too surprising that that children in blended families are going to complicate remarriages. It's not too surprising, really. And 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 individuals who are entering into a marriage where children are present from previous relationships and establish themselves as parents with these children. Uh, should really expect um, difficulties in adjustment and um, be open to the possibility of getting outside help and establishing that role successfully. It's not a reason to be, uh, you know, to feel as though you're failing or that you should be able to handle this. This is a new thing, and and uh, this is something that, um, you know, if if handled properly, can can have a very happy ending for everyone. 
But um, not to get too grim about marriage, because there are plenty of studies out there that, that look at what it, you know, what is it that uh, makes happy marriages. And, and uh, there are some, uh, some really interesting studies that showed that, for instance, this one here that's mentioned on this slide that said that couples have been married for 15 years uh, attribute their happiness to um, five different factors, that they think of their spouse as their best friend. This is a part of that thing about how you don't fall into, you don't get married because of romance, because you know that that uh, spell that you feel with the individual you fall in love with isn't going to last for 40 or 50 years. And, and I know there are couples who say, I love her every bit as much as I did the day I got married. And perhaps that's true. Perhaps that happens. But I don't think physically, biologically, I mean, there are things that go on in our brains when we fall in love, you know, I mean, that make us think of differently and act differently and feel differently. I don't think, you know, uh, the human body could probably stand that for 50 years. I mean, let's be truthful about that, you know, and, and think about how you feel when you fall in love and imagine that. How are you going to function for 50 years like that? And so it's probably not true that people love each other. They, they, they may continue to love, but they love differently and they love for different reasons. And, and that's wonderful. And that's part of that is being friends with each other. And, and uh, you know, actually having a connection and having things in common other than sex because that's the other thing that isn't there as frequently. Even after the first year, many people will tell you uh, of a marriage, you know, as, uh, the frequency of sex generally will decrease. And, and uh, um, so you have to find other things. And, and friendship, that, that emotional connection is something that makes marriages happy. They laugh together. They, they have the same goals. They think of marriage as something that is sacred and, and deserves their, their uh, commitment. Now, this is and and the sense that marriage is a long-term commitment these things imply that there are hard times and that the couple is dedicated to keeping their relationship together and surviving these hard times and working through them couples do not do this by ignoring problems couples do this by confronting problems and dealing with them as preferably when they're smaller but if they're bigger problems approaching those bigger problems as well you can't stay in a successful happy marriage um, and, and uh, a satisfying marriage without facing problems together. You can't do it by ignoring problems. So happy couples acknowledge their problems. They don't ignore them and they work through them together. And this is what the study by the Lowers indicated that successful couples talk about their problems together. They don't avoid them. And it, uh, on the bright side, three of every five married Americans described themselves as very happy in their marriage so this is a good thing and again tells you that this idea that you know the divorce rate is you know is uh, it's a 50 50 proposition when you get married this this tells you that's not the case Stinnett uh, studied 660 families in the United States and South America and here are some common uh, f factors in um, happy families that he found they spend a lot of time together now this is different from a marriage okay I think we're I believe in this particular slide we were talking about successful marriages right here we're talking about happy families okay and so happy families spend a lot of time together this includes children and parents and that's something that you know it's harder and harder to do these days with everybody having their own car and their own organizations and their own schedules to keep in their own jobs successful families see to it that they spend time together they express appreciation for each other. They are committed to promoting each other's welfare. They talk together. They listen to each other a lot. They tend to be religious. Uh, uh, churches have a way of, 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 of binding families together. Uh, a church attendance will do that, but certainly belonging to a religion. And when a crisis arises, they deal with it in a positive manner. And again, that's that thing about, you know, confronting the crisis, growing from it, learning from it, and moving forward. So, you know, in the end, I think we could tell people who are spelling and preaching about the doom of marriages and families that, that uh, this is not going to become a relic. And in fact, um, in my belief and the belief of many individuals, the changing face of the institution of marriage and family is only going to ensure that that institution remains healthy and contributing to the 
uh, to the vitality of our society. You know, uh, change has to occur in order for it to not be, uh, to become irrelevant. And so this change is probably is going to contribute to the vitality of the institution. Cohabitation, single mothers, postponing marriage, grandparents as parents, um, many, many different things that, that there are trends in our society right now. And, and we need to be able to accept and appreciate all different forms of families and marriages um, and, and um, in order for individuals to be able to fulfill themselves. And it is true that while uh, women continue to gain marital power as they join the workforce, um, I believe true equality of marriage isn't on the horizon right away. And uh, we need we should also acknowledge that we've made gains in progress. And, and I'm, I'm guessing that some of you are sitting there saying this is not true. Um, but when you really step back from it and look at it, when you consider those things inside of us that are deep within inside of us, um, um, we, we still are very much clinging to traditional gender roles and, and concepts of marriage and family. And these are things that I think we consciously have to continue to work to rise above and also to raise our children and the young people of the next generation uh, to expect differences. So that will conclude the discussion for um, this week's Learning Unit on Marriage and Family. If you have any questions, please contact me um, through email and I'll be happy to, to respond to you as quickly as I can. Otherwise, I will talk with you again next week.